This is part 2 of my Konosuba Season 1 series. Go check out the previous episode if you missed it. Last time there was a Dolahan guy who was upset because Megumin pulled a sneaky by continuing to explode his fortress. She is bullied for her lack of self-control, but is resistant to violent lectures. Aqua is bullied for being an accomplice to Meglu's war crimes. The Dolahan formally introduces himself as Verdia and declares that his primary motive for his return was to avenge Darkness's presumed death, whom he respected as a fellow knight. She is fine though. Verdia is shook. Aqua pokes fun at the embarrassing scene. Virgo is enraged. Aqua doesn't want none of his sass and blasts that fool with a fat load of holy magic. Verdant yet lives. Aqua is concerned. He summons an army of undead in fear. Aquater ramps up the juice. It's pretty effective. Verdia unleashes his army on the citizens, but the dead are only interested in Aqua's radiant energy. Darkness is jealous. Aqua kites the mobs into the rest of the party, leading to a chase. Kazuma has a brain blast and instructs Megumin to charge up a bomb. He lures the undead to Verdia, allowing Goomer to go nuts. She is elated by this most opportune moment, conjuring the familiar psychedelic swirling pools of cosmic energy, which pleasingly lead to the pinnacle of all sorcery, the almighty blaze of explosion magic. Megumin faints in complete ecstasy. The town celebrates her achievement. Verbo remains resilient, however, finding her power amusing. He challenges them to a duel, but is met with a mob of angry peasants. They don't stand a chance against his cool moves though. The plebs are awaiting the arrival of their savior, Mitsubishi, the nerd who got scammed last episode. Kazuma is regretful. Darkness engages with their doom in defense of the fallen. She fantasizes about being defeated as they clash. Darkness goes for the kill move while Verdia prepares to repost. She predictably misses, however, everyone is shook. Verdia attempts to end the fight, but only manages to make Darkness more aroused. She disorients him with her masochistic perversion, buying Kazuma some time to splash some water on the combatants. Darkness enters a new era of depravity as Kazuma freezes Verdia in place, trying to snatch his knife. He fails. Kazuma uses his gamer intuition to follow the Dulahan's attack patterns and find a weakness. Meanwhile, Darkness is defeated. Kazuma launches a barrage of juice, compelling the wizards to do the same. Aqua doesn't understand what's going on and insults Kazuma. She's instructed to pee on that guy over there. The goddess of wet demands an apology first, but is inspired by wrath to pour a heaping deluge of holy sauce on that nasty dead boy. The entire populace is swept away by her ample flood. Verdia, even so, remains existent. Kazuma places his destiny in the hands of Lady Luck while Verdia begins his deadly combo. Well, would you look at that? Kazuma has devious intentions introducing the primitives to modern sports. Aqua summons her staff and unleashes some more holy power on the weakened Dulahan, instantly banishing him to the Shadow Realm. Some time later, Kazuma is accosted by a drunk goddess and the busty guild woman. She has a reward for his party's heroics. This guy recites poetry about Kazuma's good deeds. The raggedy adventurers celebrate their narrow victory. Kazuma is awarded $300 million. He immediately attempts to retire. Aqua attempts to split the loot 90-10. The other girl want to continue to be destructive in their own ways. The guild girl interrupts the group's quarrel by explaining how Aqua damaged the town so thoroughly that they're actually 40 million dollars in debt now. Kazuma's ill-fated adventure once more hopelessly spirals back into a Sisyphean struggle to escape from hell on earth. Kazuma awakens to a familiar scene. It's heaven, and he has died once again. Presumably back in time, winter has arrived, and money is understandably tight. The cold embrace of winter nearly claimed Kazuma in the the night, and so they must raise money to survive. The other adventurers have gone into hibernation for the winter after being rewarded for fighting off the Demon King's general. The crew get together to pick out a quest. Darkness wants to be torn apart by wolves. Megumin wants to fight an enormous bear. They decide on a bounty for snow sprites, expensive little fellas that float around in the cold areas. Darkness is suspiciously aroused. Later, the party all convenes at the sprite farm. Kraslow comments on the girls' outfits. Darkness is a pervert and loves the bite of winter. Sprite collection is tricky, but doable. Megumin goes for the explosion. It is predictably over-effective, obliterating eight sprites and every living thing within the surrounding radius. Kawuma is beginning to find pleasure in the slaughter. A mysterious creature emerges from the fog. Megumin plays dead while darkness prepares for battle. Aqua explains that the snow sprite's guardian, the winter shogun, arrives when his precious orbs are slain. Darkness becomes aroused by the thought of being eviscerated by a samurai. 
Kazuma laments his situation. The samurai is clearly too strong of an opponent. Aqua quickly informs Kazuma that the Shogun will forgive him if the sprites are set free and they prostrate themselves. Aqua does just that. The Shogun is pleased. Kazuma is shook. Darkness is forced to bow. She is aroused. Aqua warns Kazuma about brandishing his weapon. He responds by doing exactly that and is shot by the police. Now here we are, back at square one. This time, it's Eris, Aqua's rival. She carries herself like a goddess should, surprising Kazuma with her politeness. She promises great treasures in Kazuma's next life, to which he responds by celebrating the sweet release of death. Aqua interrupts from the world of the living to bring Kazakhstan back. She gaslights Eris into breaking the rules of heaven to resurrect Kenny. He is completely seduced by Eris's coyness and is sucked back into reality. Kazuma is assailed by the women. Megumin reveals that he was decapitated. Kazuma soliloquizes about the brutality of this world in response. Some time later, Aqua smuggled a snow sprite. Kazuma wants to kill it for money, but Aqua has grown attached and wants to use it as a refrigerator. They discuss the logistics of raising a snow sprite and eventually become hungry. Kazuma reflects on his trip to heaven, falling deeper into the abyss of idol worship. They spent all their reward cash on a lavish meal instead of rationing for the winter. Darkness fantasizes about doing more difficult quests in the future, as Kazuma once more muses over his unfolding tragedy of a second life. Winter is becoming more unbearable as Aqua attempts to burn Kazuma's precious tracksuit. They duel. Unfortunately, their fire is taken from them while they quarrel. Sometime later, Kazuma determines that he must be the arbiter of his party's balance and goes to visit a shopkeeper named Wiz for some assistance. Aqua goes feral in the presence of the undead, but is pacified by Kazuma. Wiz is a clumsy yet powerful lich known as the No Life King. At some time in the past, Aqua caught her in the act of helping lost souls move on, trampling her operation and taking over the job. Kazuma asks to be taught a skill, once more sending Aqua into a frenzy. She introduces herself as a goddess and threatens Wiz again. Wiz is afraid, not of Aqua herself, but of the people who worship her, all of whom Wiz deemed to be crazy. Aqua proves the rumors to be true by violently assaulting her bosom. After some off-camera diplomacy, Wiz compliments Kazuma on his triumph over Verdia-san. It turns out they knew each other, and Wiz is one of the eight generals of the Demon King's army. Aqua goes for the arrest. Wiz defends herself by explaining that she maintains a barrier and means no harm. She goes on to explain that to destroy the shield around the Demon King's domain, all the generals must be defeated. Kazuma inquires about her relationship with Verdia, to which she replies by unearthing the depths of Verdia's depravity. Wiz ultimately decides to teach Klajnikov how to suck power by demonstrating on Aqua. Aquarium takes this demonstration as a challenge, preventing Waz from slurping on her god juice. She is reprimanded. Kazuma learns the skill, drain life. A customer appears. He offered to loan out his house in exchange for an exorcism of a ghost from said house. Aqua is confident in her skills as an archpriest goddess. She senses the soul of an absurdly dramatic child whose excessively drawn out, complex story Aqua proceeds to recite. Later, after some cleaning, Aqua continues while the rest of the party head to bed. Kazuma is elated by their new crib, confident in Aqua's anti-undead capabilities. Aqua suddenly lets out a scream of terror. Her treasured bottle of booze was found empty. Kazuma is unsurprised. Aqua swears vengeance on the spirits which roam the house and goes on a divine rampage through the infested mansion. In the darkness of night, Kazuma awakens to paranormal activity. A gaggle of freaky dolls have manifested themselves at his bed. They chase him to Aqua's room, where Megumin awaits vigilantly for similar reasons. They share a common goal of going pee. The restroom has become an object of contention and an important goal for over overcoming this peril, causing the allies to break out into a quarrel over who gets to pee first. They are interrupted by swathes of phantom puppetry. Megumin gets to go first, but is too afraid to produce. Kazuma senses the dolls and busts in to make a hasty retreat. In the safety of the closet, he contemplates using a vase, while Mego begins to cast explosion magic. Their reckoning has arrived. Kazuma emits a war cry, opening the door and incapacitating Aqua. The next day, the party is awarded a bonus at the guild. The guild girl reveals that someone put up a barrier around the graveyard, causing a bunch of spirits to bounce off and wiggle into that vacant mansion. Aqua is reprimanded in the corner for stirring up trouble then taking credit for fixing said trouble. Megumind and Darkness play chess while Kazuma stares blankly at a fire. Aqua declares herself to be the highest ranking party member and attempts to relinquish the prime spot from Kazuma. She explains how all her stats were maxed from the start. Megumin cheats at chess while Kazuma comforts Aqua for having 
such a low baseline intelligence. Sometime later, a couple of fellas are pondering whether or not to head to a brothel, while Kazuma sneaks up on them. They unveil their dark secret, a succubus hovel that allows you to have any dream you want. The staff instantly hypnotizes the adventurers with their gigantic honkers flopping in the wind. Kazuma is nervous, but is comforted by the boiled hard man who has a way with encouraging words. Kazuma peeps his sheet, revealing our audience insert to be a weaver by trade. Kago Marino's succububer explains something to someone about how whatever it is was happening is going on. Sorry. Kazuma's succubus explains that they sneak into the customer's house at night, take some vitality, and give them custom dreams. Kazuma feels that this should eventually lead to world peace, and is handed a questionnaire. The whole deal is a really open-ended shindig. He then ponders whether the male population is psychologically well. Kazuma fails to describe in full detail what exactly a 2D waifu is, but the hooker remains confident in their establishment's abilities. He is warned not to drink beforehand, and the story continues. Crabs and booze for Dindin. Then, courtesy of Darkness's wealthy parents. It's a luxurious day. An erotic food-eating scene ensues. Kazuma is delighted. Aqua invents a new soup with her alcohol. It's good, I guess? Kazuma stops himself early due to his date with the succubus. He is horribly conflicted and trembles in despair for the glorious meal that must go to waste. Aqua is fondled by Megumin while Kazuma cherishes his companions. He suddenly makes a quick exit. The excitement disrupts his attempts at sleep, however. Kazuma takes a bath to relax, but drifts into a slumber. Later that night, darkness appears out of the gloom. Kazuma determines that this must be a dream and plays it cool, cucumber style. Darkness is understandably speechless. A lot of Back and forth about dream nonsense happens while the fan service plays out. Some hilariously perverse backwashing occurs. Darkness can't say no because of her masochism. Kazuma demands various things while sounding like a pervy old man. Aqua raises the alarm after detecting an intruder. Kazuma darts off to find the trapped and cornered succubus. Aqua goes for the kill, but she is interrupted by a determined Kazuma, ready to defend what he finds most precious. The girls are shook. The succubus tries to stop him from humiliating himself by accepting her death. Kazuma holds strong. Aqua readies her weapons as darkness slides out from the hallway, declaring Kazuma to be charmed. Kazuma urges his Dreamweaver to flee one last time. Both sides prepare for battle. Klebzoomer is defeated, but his honor is upheld. The next day, Kazuma manages to lie about being mind-controlled. Lastly, alarm bells herald the coming of the Destroyer. The city erupts into chaos as Kazuma's party begins to flee. Darkness explains that the Destroyer only brings destruction, as implied by the name. Kazuma Kazuma is determined to fight back and defend his hard work. Later at the guild, the clerk and her green comrade explain the situation. The destroyer was created long ago by a long dead, ancient, magical empire. Kazuma laments his misfortune. Chris compels him to produce a heroic plan to defeat the elderly doom spider. He quickly ideates, coming up with the vague plan of simply breaking its invincible barrier by using a vast amount of magical power. Strangely enough, Kazuma's party is perfectly balanced for taking down extremely large and dangerous foes. The crowd glare expectantly at Megumin. She discloses her lack of confidence and shame. Wiz shows up as the deus ex machina to give the adventurers that much more of a boost. They celebrate her arrival as the guild's mega babe does a few sensual pirouettes for inspiration. Darkness stoically poses far into the vanguard while awaiting the destroyer. Kazuma questions her lack of excitement, to which she responds by stating her real name and lineage. Dustiness Ford Lalatina, daughter of the local governing house, protecting the lives of her countrymen, has always been a top priority. Kazuma doesn't mind hearing her secret and responds positively. He calls her Lalatina and is sonically annihilated. The destroyer approaches at last, clad in magical armor, weaponized lasers, and an aura of death. Everyone quakes from fear. Waze is confident, but sets expectations. Megumin struggles to remain composed. Aqua unloads a splendid glimmering light of holy radiance into the robo ungoliant's protective covering. It has limited effects. Aquart goes Super Saiyan, probably doubling her output with a scream. Aragog's shield is dispelled successfully, leading to a stage 2 of the offense. Gumi is nervous. She and Wiz synchronously channel their respective explosive conflagrations, cinematically propelling the swirling masses of energy into the destroyer's exposed carapace. It is incapacitated before obliterating darkness. Megumin compliments Wiz on her marvelous output and passes out. The crowd begins to 
celebrate. Their cheers bear an ill fate, as the spider has yet to perish. Its eyes pulsate red, announcing the immediate activation of a self-destruct sequence. Everyone begins to flee. Darkness is stubborn, and aroused by the thought of being caught in the epicenter of an explosion large enough to cause an extinction-level event. Kazuma is unsurprised, as darkness leads the charge. The others follow shortly after, recalling what precious treasures this hollowed city contains. The male populace has never been so invigorated as they fervently scale the beast. Wiz suggests that they find the spider's orb somewhere inside the destroyer. They find the skeletal remains of its creator, along with his personal diary, which reveals the events leading up to his inevitable demise. He was contracted to build a huge weapon, was given a mystery orb of power called Coronatite, and somehow got it to work, ultimately causing the extinction of that ancient civilization. The old fella wasn't too bothered though, and decided to hang out on the spider till death. Back in the present, they found the plant here, but don't really know what to do with it. Wiz suggests that they teleport it somewhere, but she lacks the magical juice to do so. Kazuma is offered to be sucked dry. He immediately accepts, at last believing in fate. He is violently drained of his wizard juice. The orb begins to become enraged, signaling their limited time. Wiz warns the pair that she doesn't have time to designate a location, so Kazuma takes responsibility for the results, citing his high luck statistic as a catalyst for confidence. They do the thing. Darkness is stoically awaiting the tantalizing pleasure of experiencing detonation when the destroyer begins to glow orange from heat. Kazuma is confused. Wiz determines that it was probably holding energy in his body, and now that energy is trying to escape. Megumin arrives in splendor, hoisted exuberantly on the back of a worthy steed, prepared to be the deus ex machina this time. She is suddenly grabbed by the neck for optimal magic transfer. The girls are resistant, but eventually reach a compromise. Megumin is allowed to not only indulge in releasing a second explosion in one day, but also to experience what it's like to do so with the power of a literal god. She once more conjures the all-familiar array of spirals and circles, leading to the ultimate display of a wizard's ability, a pyre so excellent that Kazuma is likely to be buried further in debt from the repercussions. All things return to normalcy as Kazuma reflects on his journey to the other world. It has remained a far cry from the traditional vision he originally held, but some things have changed. He has a party of horribly unwell girls, a nice house, powerful allies, a growing notoriety, and one hefty crime of suspected subversion to the state by teleporting an unstable coronatite onto the duke's mansion. Kazuma reflects on his journey to the other world. It has been hell on earth from start to finish. He prays to Eris-sama that one day he may be able to venture to a parallel world where he can finally be at peace, and that is the end of season one of Konosuba. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, like and subscribe if you enjoyed. I have a Patreon uh, for those who are interested. Uh, thanks again. Bye.